strategy, design, marketing, UX, digital, development. This is Agencies That Build. This show is dedicated to leaders and teams that design and deploy in the digital world. My name is Jesse, and I'm a marketer and an agency owner. And I'm Varun. I'm not a marketer, but a coder and an agency partner. This show is sponsored by Together We Ship. On a mission to help agencies grow. All right, here we go. Hi, Varun. How are you? Good. I'm excited. I'm cool. I'm ready to start. I know you're still sporting that Together t-shirt, so I... It's uh, for those watching on the video, we've got some nice new branded merch <laughs> that Varun's sporting. But for those listening, sorry, you can't see it. Um, so we're going to dive in. I'm, I'm pumped to talk to today's guest. We have a couple of really interesting topics um, and myths that he's, that he's going to bust. So he is a U.S. Marine Corps veteran. He's a university professor teaching classes in SEO, SEM as an adjunct professor at North Carolina State University. Easy for me to pronounce right now. Um, he's a marketing consultant certified by Google, HubSpot, Bing, and SEM Rush. He's the managing partner of Lyft Digital Marketing, Aaron Welsh. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm excited too. Well, so, all right. So we had, we were just, as we were chatting before this, this podcast, you know, we were talking about a couple of myths that you wanted to bust. And usually we like to pick one, but you've got two very interesting ones that you'd like to set the record straight on. So I'll, I'll let you pick which one you would like to bust first and set that record straight and clear up this misconception, which one you want to start with. Well, I will start with uh, the need for long-term contract. So yes, the, uh, the myth that you need uh, long-term contracts for clients. Here at Lyft Digital Marketing, we don't have contracts. We have a marketing service agreement, which kind of spells out the, the scope of work, but it's month to month renewable. There is no locked-in period. And we actually worked this way in my first agency Red becomes media. We were month to month basis with every single client. And, and that's how I operate today. Honestly, it's a great selling point because there is a lot of hesitancy with clients because typically people have been through the ringer. They've hired a freelancer or an agency. They didn't get what they were promised. They didn't get very good results. And they're naturally skeptical. So working with them on a month to month basis, one, it builds credibility with us because we know that we have to perform on a monthly basis. And two, it lessens their risk. It can be, it's a leap of faith to sign a contract, a six month contract or a year long contract for somebody you kind of have just interviewed. We, I don't, I'm not aware of any businesses uh, that, that work that way. So we don't work that way as vendors. So tell, yeah. tell, tell me more about what type of marketing services that you offer that does not require long-term agreements. I guess uncover how that works, you know, because as a client, I imagine, or even as a service provider, I mean, it takes certain time to achieve the result, right? So how do you structure your services in a way that produces some result in a month? Because as a client, I mean, what will I see in next four weeks for which I'm paying? And then within four weeks, you are basically allowing customer to just end the contract if they don't see result. And one month is kind of short to see yeah. any result, right? So how do you define you the, the success metrics so people want to subscribe or continue with you uh, and see the value in just four weeks yeah certainly and, and you know uh, you're right just for context sorry uh, we do search engine marketing SEO web design and development content marketing uh, account-based marketing social media marketing so yeah especially along the lines of SEO and web design and development, because one of the things we do is migrate websites, particularly off of GoDaddy or Wix or Squarespace, kind of those, you know, drag and drop 
platforms onto either HubSpot CMS or WordPress. And obviously that takes longer than a month. Like nobody's that, that good. I would be skeptical if somebody could migrate or build a website in a month anyway. So what we do, we're very clear upfront with expectations. 80% of client service, maybe more, is managing expectations. So when we start the engagement, we'll have a clear like set of deliverables. You know, look, we think this project's going to take three months. So here are the deliverables on a weekly or monthly basis. And if we don't deliver, you know, you're paying us for the work, so you keep the work. But uh, if they're unhappy after a month, and we're obviously not going to deliver a three-month project in a month, I get, we don't lock them in. Now, uh, part of that is, again, and the same with SEO. You know, It can take three months, six months, 12 months to see real measurable result versus baseline. But having you know, touch points along the way, you know, are we delivering the audit? You know, have we delivered the audit? Have we delivered a content plan? Are we delivering content on time? There are measurables, there are deliverables along the way that also builds our credibility. We're delivering on a monthly basis and you know, we're not the folks to say, oh, we're gonna get you a number one in Google in a month. Like, yeah. it's just not realistic. So we're super realistic and honest and transparent uh, at some of our core values. And again, this is a great way to manage expectations. And if there's a client who, you know, we're very clear on it's going to be take three months to migrate your website and they're upset after month one, even though we delivered on the schedule, then they're free to leave because they're probably going to be an unreasonable and a problem client anyway. Well, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting note. You know, we've talked a lot about in the podcast and how to identify clients who may not be the right fit for you. Yes. Is the nice way to say that. Let me, before we dive into that for a second, I have a question around the deliverables in terms of these months to months, you're talking about transparency and being really clear about what and when as part of that onboarding proposal discovery process, do you, or maybe you do it like pre-kickoff or something, do you describe what the deliverables are on a per monthly basis and deliver some sort of calendar? So there's an expectation of like, you know, month one, you're going to get the taxonomy plan for your new website. Month two, you're going to get page design for your new website. Month three, we're actually going to build pages and you'll, you know, is it very, do you get that granular with it? Tell us a little bit more. We, we do. And it's part of our proposal. Okay. I mean, you know, we, we scope things out. Uh, so yeah, there is, you know, probably a little bit of a longer sales cycle, but uh, yeah, we're, you know, again, it's managing expectations and we want to be transparent and manage those expectations before they even agree. You know, if, if we can agree on the deliverables as part of the, you know, uh, as part of signing them up, then it's kind of like one, I've never had a client just bail on a project like that because re again, reasonable people, they know what they're going to uh, get. <laughs> they know what they're going to get. And as long as we deliver what they've what they've agreed to i've never had any client ever bail on it bail on a service agreement like that yeah and i i think it's a great point and it, i think it's a great way to structure the contract not only for marketing services but also i feel for the uh, software development we do a lot of product development software engineering and i can see the value in structuring the contracts where you can build your project plan in a way that there are certain deliverables for a fixed timeline and you, people even do that but structuring in, structuring them in a way that here are the deliverable you can take them and then if you want to end it in the middle you can still do it because you have a working or at least you have something that you can take and go somewhere else, uh, build in-house or, you know, do uh, hire someone else, you know, e either way yeah. you have that flexibility and you are giving them that freedom. They're not going to go away because you, you know, you have trusted, they have trusted you, they have already engaged with you, but in their mind, they will feel safe. They will feel that, yes, at least I have that flexibility and freedom that I can, 
you know, close it and end the contract anytime. So it's a great way to use in, in the pitch when you are bringing it in front of the client. So, so yeah, great point. Thank yeah. You. And it's, it, I mean, it, it has been a key differentiator and put us over the top. I don't know how many times. I mean, it's nice. Yeah. It's, there's a level of, uh, there's a level of comfort when there's an exit plan. You know, and yeah, easily, exactly. You know, it's not when there is, you're not stuck. You're not going, am I, you're constantly, you know, with these longer term contracts, you're constantly evaluating if it's worth the money. In this case, every month as an agency, you have to prove yourself and they know what the value is because you're delivering on a regular basis, you know, and vice versa, as you mentioned earlier, are they the right fit for you? If they're not delivering what they promise as a, as a good client, you, you have an exit plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and, you know, uh, in the case where, and this is always the case, especially with content or websites, clients usually slow. So they continue to pay us. And if they're holding up progress, they're still continuing to pay us. So it's almost a built in motivator for them to not fall behind. Also, True. And don't get me wrong, I'll take the money if they're not delivering and it's not our fault. It, it, it's almost like a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great motivator for them as well. We don't, we typically don't fall behind on projects. Well, and it's an interesting way to make sure that you're resourcing and tracking the work appropriately, which is tends to be a struggle. You know, again, we'll, we'll get into some of it later, probably in our conversation, but from a resourcing perspective for, especially, you know, if you think about even the business that we're in being able to plan and support, you know, how projects are going to progress in yeah. this case it might be a little bit more predictable than in other cases you know there's a, the risk might be a little bit higher um you know from a revenue and a guarantee perspective but maybe not who knows it depends on yeah. the, the level of project so interesting very yeah. interesting <laughs> um I would, well and it's I would, <laughs> that's no, also a great the great lead, a, a great lead into the second myth uh, you got it. <laughs> you know, I've done this before. Uh, <laughs> segue. We require payment up front every month. We bill at the first of the month for work that's going to be done in that month rather than billing in the rears or billing on terms like a net 30. Uh, we don't operate that way. Let's clearly state the myth for those folks listening. So the, the, the myth is that you, um, you don't have to you collect payment up front, which is, you know, and is it full or is it, I mean, since you're in these cases, since it is a month to month, is it full payment for the month? Yes. Within the month. Okay. Yes. Cool. No, no, the same, I just, I just wanted to clarify that because you're basically saying before we even start the work, we need the money up front, the entire money, and then we'll do for that month. Uh, no net 30, no net 60. It's, you know, you need to pay before you, when we touch your work. Absolutely. And Rarely, okay, I can't say rarely, maybe even half the time. Boy, that rarely to half is a big gap. A uh, bit of a jump. But we regularly get, get some pushback on this uh, because it's there's kind of not an industry standard on whether you're you know billing forward, billing ahead, billing with terms. And, and honestly, our response, and this happened with just you know our, our current largest client the other day. Because we're offering a 30-day you know, service agreement and a monthly out, we think getting paid up front is a very fair offset to you know, paying or billing in the rears. And, 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 like, what does that look like when people are like, yeah, we're not doing that? I won't say any names. Uh, <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> no, I'm not. But usually it's, if we paid all of our vendors like this, then we'd be in a terrible cash flow crunch. Like, yeah, you're right. So why is that our, like, why are we taking on your cash flow responsibilities? We're not a bank. We don't extend terms. Uh, and there's tons of vendors that you pay up front. You just don't think of it that way. Every piece of software, every tool, Microsoft for Microsoft 0365 or Amazon Cloud or Azure or whatever they're all getting paid up front. We just don't think of it in the same, in the same way. Uh, I even had one uh, ask me if I paid my employees up front. 
you know, a, a, as a way to push back against why he, they should pay us up front. And, you know, my response was no, absolutely not. I don't pay them up front, but I do pay them every two weeks and they get paid within four days of the end of the pay period. So if you want me to bill you every two weeks with a credit card, because that's basically how they're billing me for their time, then I'm willing to do that. And nobody's taken me up on that. What was the, it's an interesting point that you make because it's, well, I'm going to get real meta on you guys for a minute. So, you know, the balancing service industry and deliverables associated with the services that you're purchasing versus, you know, um, paying for technology and the differences in how people think about those things. You know, you think about, you know, if you go to the doctor, for example, you're not paying up front to be able to go to the doctor. There's the whole insurance component of it, but you do have to pay something sometimes with a copay in those cases. But it's, um, you know, there's been a big trend recently with smaller local businesses, for example, and a lot of these technologies that you mentioned earlier that people are migrating off of. Like if you're mm-hmm. going to go see uh, your hairdresser, you can book an appointment online and usually to reserve the spot, you pay up front. They haven't done the yep. work yet you know, in some of these cases or some other types of vendors that you may go see, you're paying up front for these services. So why should it be any different, I guess, for some of the things that, that we're all delivering, especially with the way that you articulated the way that you build out your contracts? I guess that leads me to another question. Have you found, you know, and everybody does, we talk a lot about pricing with, with folks and how we do pricing and how you scope stuff out. It's a natural point of conversation amongst yeah. agencies. I guess when you're looking at projects, you know, for some of those projects that might be a finite amount of time versus more of those services, you know, SEO tends to be a longer month to month type of engagement for some of those like website migrations, for example, do you find that, you know, uh, if you were to bill uh, in full or, you know, 50% upfront, 50% upon delivery, do the contracts change size versus the month to month billing? Have you seen any sort of shift in the amount of money you're making is really where this question is going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, we're making more money with billing up front on a month to month basis than on a project basis. We refuse to take on any purely project based work. Uh, I've done websites where it's half up front, half at the end. And every single time scope, scope creep is terrible and the clients aren't motivated So they'll be really slow with their deliverables. And that three month project can easily stretch into six and nine months and eat up any profit potential. Uh, That's why we don't operate that way anymore. And and we're a small business. Yeah, Yeah, scope creep is a killer. Uh, Totally. Because I started out like purely billing hourly. Like Mm -hmm. we'll bill you hourly for hours worked. And at that point, then it, you've become a commodity and there's always going to be a lower price somewhere. And, you know, there's value, like we bring value. We bring much more value than just an hourly, an hourly charge. So we've, we've been able to increase revenue and profitability and literally lost, never lost a contract. Yeah. That, that's quite interesting to, here, uh, doing work that way, just because, and, and I'm thinking again from website development project, for example, right? So do you, I'm trying to get little, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. process side, like how, can, can you share an example of a type of website project that you might have done where, you know, a fixed cost did not work? I mean, because I'm imagining in my head, like somebody comes to you with a scope, like I want to build this website in WordPress. Here are the you know, custom plugins that I may want or search feature on that feature. So how do you plan for that when you are not creating it into a fixed cost gig, right? I mean, how do you like, all right, it's a three month project, but then you are going to build them every month. Um, but how would you know, and how, how would you arrange the, how do you, you know, divide those into three months? So here, here is the secret. I, because I still haven't developed a better way, I scope it out as a project and I, and I you, know, you know, scope out those deliverables and, and have a timeline 
you know, and if it's a 90 day project, then I say, okay, here are the deliverables. It's going to be 90 days and, you know, it's going to happen over three payments. Like I divide by three and take payment one up front, take payment two at the end of month for one, take payment three at the end of month two. Uh, and again, it helps push them for their deliverables. It helps push us. I mean, there's, there are hard deadlines. Uh, so it, you know, people don't, you know, blow something off, uh, which is nice. It, it's kind of a built-in management component. Uh, and honestly, at the end of the end of the day, I don't have to worry about cash flow. We are, have a cash flow positive business model this way. So, and, and for those people who aren't interested and who want to do like, okay, go fix my SEO on this website. How much is, how much will it cost? Like, well, we don't work that way. Marketing is a living and breathing thing. So we'll, here's the scope of our services. We'll do all these things for your website. This will be a component of that. And sometimes mm -hmm. that puts people off and they're not interested and they were probably not going to be great clients anyway. Let me ask you one more question about this. And then we want to, we want to shift to a few other topics, <laughs> you know, um, scope creep is, uh, is, uh, oh. something we all have to deal with in this particular case. And I'm curious with the, with, you know, that three month project you just outlined, you have set deliverables and plans. It, it, scope creep is inevitable. Somebody comes in or a new stakeholder comes in and says, Oh, can we add a widget that, you know, flies, whatever, wherever, you know, um, how does that, do you deal with those in one-off cases or how does that work with this particular billing model? So the mechanism that I use is version two. Mm -hmm. That'll be part of version two. If there's, if we deliver faster and it can be included in version one, awesome. Bonus, we have the bandwidth, that's great. But otherwise that's version two. Uh, right. you know, let's go ahead and launch yeah. what we've let's got. Let's get because, what we planned. We'll plan out yeah. for month four, you know, let's, let's go yeah, from there. Or we're... do you want to swap out plan deliverables? Like we can do that, but you're not going to get this. So this is the negotiation component. Yeah, so. absolutely. And, and if there's more scope creep, again, I, I like to pack it in on the back uh, because, you know, we deliver what we, what we'd agreed on. And, you know, how many times have, have you all experienced perfect being the enemy of good enough like trying to get things Every perfect before launch yeah <laughs> i mean is uh, it not the the plight of the world that we live in no so. kidding right so it guards against that too and it's also just a, a real subliminal way to build in this is not the end like this is the you know this is part of what we're doing this is an ongoing engagement we're long term partners so building that in, building that scope creep in as version two or two, you know, the next round or optimizations, that's how we handle that. Cool. So let's shift gears for a quick minute. You, um, you know, we talked a, a minute ago about what you do, you know, what, what your agency does. Um, let's talk a little bit how you got into that. And, you know, I want to specifically highlight that you are one of your niches in particular is that you guys are veteran owned you know, yes. that you, that you only employ veterans as well, which I think is a really unique, we've not talked to somebody who takes that approach. So just want to point that out for listeners. Um, but how did you get into this? Digital marketing in general, gee, I fell into it like pure happenstance. Well, I was early adopter to the internet. You know, I was a guy on the internet when it was purely green screen. Uh, I remember Netscape Navigator. So I'm old. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was the only guy in the barracks with a computer. So, okay. you know, I was super familiar and really I had a friend who was a property manager who went to change some light bulbs in one of her tenants buildings. And it, they were hiring, they were a digital marketing company. They asked if she was there for an interview and I was unemployed at the moment. I had just moved to, uh, to Austin, Texas from Houston, Texas. So she said, no, I'm not here, but I've got this friend. He, he knows the internet back and forth. Let me give him a call. And I was interviewing that afternoon and they, they hired me that day. 
So cool. it was literally, you know, it was 2000 and 2001, you know, they had investment money. So they were just hiring almost anybody off the street. Uh, <laughs> and, and it was a sales job. It was, you know, it was pretty, it was a pretty easy sell. Uh, it was mall.com. So they had a super top line domain name and the pitch was pretty easy. It was us selling real estate on the website and, you know, we were smiling and dialing and emailing, you know, Hey, are you interested? You know, you're in, a, you're in malls across the, uh, across the country. You need to be on mall.com. And I started in a sales role. And again, it was, it was an easy sell. And I started making friends with the people who were generating the website traffic. And that was far more interesting to me because it was a puzzle. You know, how are we going to get people to the website? Here are the mechanisms to do it. It was at the very beginning of paid search paid search before Google was doing it. So find what and go to.com. So literally like building keywords and managing bids. And that was, that was way more fun to me than calling up people and asking for money. So that's, that was my start. I actually left that job and started my own agency inside a year, which was again, you know, that's a quick no turn. experience. Yeah, no experience, uh, fearless slash ignorant. You know, me and the other top salesperson started our own agency where he was selling clients and I was generating the traffic. And that's how we started. That's how I started my first agency. So it very much just kind of fell into it and, you know, pivoted. I mean, Cert, paid search. So we were Google beta tester, Google AdWords beta testers back when it was crazy easy. Uh, nobody was bidding. We started all these side businesses. We were, uh, you know, generating debt consolidation leads for like $15 a pop and selling them for $50 a pop. Uh, affiliate marketing sites before Google literally destroyed an industry uh, with Penguin and uh, change that all up. Yeah, and that's how we got started. So, that's you've how had, I got started. so you've had two, you know, we know we, you've had, you started at one agency, um, you moved on to start a different agency. What would you, you know, comparing the two experience there for folks listening again, where we're talking to people who have started agencies or are trying to learn from each other. What would you say that you took from the first one that you, you've done differently for the second one, you know, are there a couple of nuggets of awesomeness you can share and maybe a couple of nuggets of oops, let's not do that again. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's definitely plenty of both. I mean, I was a, I mean, when, so uh, just for a little more context in my first agency, we went, you know, we hit our credit limit. We couldn't financially grow the business anymore. So we went out and raised $5 million of investment capital on our first pitch, which does not happen. No, nope. like it's a bad example, but we went out and did it. And we, of course we took our first, you know, we got that first offer and took it. We were like, okay, this is easy done. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and then we scaled up with that investment money. There's, I was, you know, God, I, I was a millionaire at age 28 with all this investment money and out of the Marine Corps. So my ability to manage people was horrendous. I very much used some of that Marine Corps leadership to manage people in the real world. And uh, it, it was not always pretty. I learned a ton about how to manage people and how, how, to, how to treat employees some good, some bad, you know, uh, that was a, that was a tremendous learning experience. You know, some of what could have been done better is, you know, my business partner and I, like, we didn't have a lot of the things you should have in place, like buy, sell agreement, key man agreement. You know, we were just, we were winging it. We had never had a business before. Both of us had, you know, 
little or no college, which we were actually like very proud of at the time. Like, you don't need a you don't need education to do this. Well, you do. It helps tremendously. Uh, <laughs> so I got to learn a lot. You know, especially being partnered up with uh, a billionaire investor. You know, he taught me how to just think at a bigger scope and a bigger scale because we were always focused on small business and, you know, just just how to operate more maturely in a business, you know, like do employee evaluations, you know, ha have a budget. We Because before we were just winging it, you know, like. That's a funny thing how, to kind of think about and go, oh, yeah, we probably should have a budget to plan around some of this. Yeah. So. Yeah, like I got to learn plenty about HR and benefits and, you know, all of these things, you know, and I don't want it to sound like there was nothing but bad uh, or nothing but hard lessons because uh, there weren't. And, you know, I use tons of that experience in the agency now, just, you know, how, how to manage folks, how to train folks. That was a really big one, too. And I use some of that stuff today. Back in 2005, the digital market industry was so young, nobody had experience, especially in Austin, Texas. Uh, so we figured out to hire people from radio and print because that, you know, the concepts of ad buys and, you know, CPM and, you know, proving performance. Uh, there was a working framework. They, they had a framework to go off of. And we literally had to train every single employee because nobody knew how to do this thing. And we got really good at it. We went from, you know, four people to 50 in about 18 months and never became unprofitable at any moment. So even with that sort of scale, we were scaling our revenue and profitability at the same rate. And that's stuff I use today. It, it probably you know, led me to do the, uh, do the instructing that I work with SEM and SEO. I really enjoy, and it's a lot of fun, explaining somebody, teaching something to somebody, and then seeing that light bulb come on for them. That's awesome. That's an awesome feeling for me, just uh, very uh, you know, selfishly. I love seeing that. Yeah. So I want to go back to your pitch, you know, for a minute, we've had a couple of agencies on who have gotten bought um, and have uh, made acquisitions and amongst other all kinds of other things that happen in here, you know, closing that amount of money with your first pitch is pretty impressive. Was there any sort of tip or trick that you that you guys did that you can share that might be useful? Or is it just kind of you roll the dice and it happened to land on the right combination of things yeah i really do think it was right time right place you know our pitch was so rudimentary you know now having you know life experience and education since then i mean our pitch was hey we're you know making 40 percent, 50 percent profit on what we're doing we just need to scale they were like okay it was really hmm. that basic so i literally like I don't know that there's anything I can share that's worthwhile about that experience other than we got super lucky. Do you feel like it might've been, you know, the personalities? You know, I think, you know, we talk a lot about like what and who, it, not who, but like the what and how and the, the financials and things like that. But I feel like some of this like dice rolling comes down to, are we admitting the right energy and someone's going, yeah, I get it. I got you guys. Let's do that. Do you feel like that might've been a piece of it? Yeah, uh, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, you know, okay. we went in, we had a pretty detailed plan. You know, I put together like three and five and 10 year financial projections. Uh, incredibly, there was a flaw in one of my Excel formulas. And Oops. yeah, that we're presenting. And here, you know, uh, Red McCombs was probably 78 at the time. Uh, Okay, maybe younger, maybe 72. It was certainly an elder statesman. Uh, and he's leaning back and he's looking up at the spreadsheet. He's like, yeah, C29 has an error. And 
oh my God, my blood ran cold. I got pale. Uh, I was like, oh my God, what? And I'm going and looking and he was right. Like it's literally this huge spreadsheet. He's like, yeah, you, uh, yeah, that's got an error right there. So yeah, it was. Double check your math. That would be yeah. the, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's a mistake that you don't want to make. Double check your math next time you have to pitch somebody. Absolutely. How, how are you set up now? Like, you know, how is your, you know, agency now is doing work? How many people you have? How do you operate? Let's dive a little into that as well. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a very different setup. Uh, you know, I, I'm the sole equity owner this time around. Uh, our... My first agency didn't end on great terms. So now I'm a little hesitant to give up, give up equity. Uh, so that's a big difference. You know, we're completely 100% bootstrapped. So not looking for outside investment money because also when I was 28, uh, you know, I was like, okay, you know, $100 million before I'm 40, uh, you know, that's sort of, chasing the dream, chasing the ring, it's not important for me anymore. You know, uh, so my goals are very different. Uh, and my why is very different. Back then, you know, originally started the agency to pay my way through college. And then we started making a lot of money. So I dropped out of college because we were making a lot of money. And literally, you know, my business partner talked me out of staying in college uh, to, to grow the agency. Uh, which was solid logic at the time. Now it's it's very much more focused on, you know, how many people can I help grow their business? How many people can I employ? Uh, how many people can I set up so that they can have uh, like good, solid, meaningful careers? Uh, it, it, it's a completely different mindset on my part. So yeah, we, I mean, uh, so back to your question, I apologize. Uh, you know, we've got, we've got anywhere between seven and nine people, depending on how much work, which is another reason why we get paid up front so that we can resource correctly. And I don't have to worry about cash flow and lines of credit. So, you know, that is a role. Yeah, we just operate pretty differently, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and one 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 other thing that you mentioned earlier was also that you have a um, good network of freelancers and contractors that you work with. So, how is how does that go? I mean, tell us more about you know some of the um, you know success and failures, if if any, on working in that model because this is a very hot topic these days. You know, with the shortage of um, people that you can hire because everyone, can. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like so challenging right now in this market that, uh, you know, to, to hire, to find the right people having that, like, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that that mindset of working in the, you know, with freelancers and contractors might be useful for you right now because it gives you that flexibility, but back in the day you have have you always adopted this model or has it transitioned over time like how did you get into this and why did you get into this and how has it helped you over time yeah we were uh or i was i'll stop speaking in the royal we uh i was a big early adopter in offshoring uh our first off dang it, my first offshoring experiences you know were back in 2004 so before we even got investment capital, uh, working with providers overseas, India, Philippines, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, we actually, for a while, we had this really great group of Romanian guys. Uh, and it was a very different model. So we were, we were, we had six guys, we were paying their rent. They all shared a house. Uh, we paid them you know, a monthly stipend for all six of them. And it was like old school project management. Like here, here's the scope, here are the deliverables. You know, uh, we were using uh, Vonage phones, which was super very new. Uh, 
and there was really, you know, it was all on, you know, Word and and Excel and PowerPoint in terms of project management uh, tools. We used AOL <laughs> for uh, Instant Messenger, so we cobbled together uh, some of the things that now you know Monday and Asana and Skype and all of these uh, all of these different project management softwares that are worth billions and billions. Uh, man, we cobbled that back to we cobbled that together back in the day, and those group of guys were great. You know, we had some not so great providers where, you know, sometimes there is something lost in the translation. You got to be just super clear on what deliverables are. And it taught me a lot about cultural differences. You know, sometimes when somebody says yes, it means that they're hearing you, not necessarily understanding you. So you got to be real clear on, you know, conveying that understanding and, and being on the same page. And then regularly checking in, uh, you know, to make sure that, again, deliverables are met. So I've been doing it forever, uh, almost since its, you know, inception. And it's something that I still use today. Uh, absolutely. It is a trial and error basis. You know, that's why even, even with uh, freelancers, whether they're onshore or offshore, you know, everything's a trial. You test them out. You know, you, you give them 10 hours worth of work. You see how they deliver. You give them, you know, and then you scale up as they earn trust. You, you reward that trust. So we start small and let people prove themselves. And, you know, there have been, there are folks that I've been working with for decades. Well, um, yeah, that's, that's great to hear. Um, how do you, so what I'm hearing is you, and that's how, that, that's how have you have always been working, you know, where, and how's your local, like in the current team, like the team that is here in, in, uh, on site or maybe in your town, are they also involved in the process or is it you who interacts? So like, how do you like handle the team who is working remote, not even offshore, maybe, maybe, you know, in different towns, in different cities yeah. in, in this country, like, how do you manage all of them uh, with the current setup? Yeah, well, uh, my agency is 100% remote. Uh, so I'll be, and, and we were doing it before COVID just because, you know, having been in this industry for so long, you know, I've taken client calls from a beach in Costa Rica and they didn't know the difference and I was still working and it was fine. So Early on, it was very clear to me that the barrier to entry was a phone and an internet connection and a computer, uh, which is one of the good and bad things, I guess, about digital marketing. Uh, you know, how we, how, how we manage today, just being very clear, you know, lots of project management. So we're big, we're, we're Asana users, you know, we'll scope out our deliverables, you know, we very much... We're not like full agile, but we I, I very much lean on an agile uh, marketing function where we'll have our you know, week or two week sprint. You know, we have a backlog of tasks. We have, you know, somebody picks up a task. We, you know, it's work in progress. You know, when they're finished with it, it needs review, you know, whether that's from us or from the client. You know, we get approvals, then we publish or ship whatever the case may be, uh, that's, how we, that's how we manage uh, projects. And you know, using Slack, using, I try to use email as little as possible because there's so much of it. So lots of Slack, Asana, uh, you know, probably been using Zoom for seven, eight, nine, a long time. Uh, <laughs> that's interesting. 2013 maybe. That email, you know, tends to not be a, a primary communication. We've, you know, personal experience versus other agency owners that we've talked to, you know, Slack is the best thing on the planet and the devil, um, or yes. maybe the worst thing on the planet is the better. We'll keep it generic. 
but the idea of managing, you know, Asana and some of these other tools are great, great versions. I feel like, you know, one of the things that we struggle with Slack is great from cross team communication, but it's not the easiest thing on the planet to be able to, to project manage through or oh, you know, yeah, no. instant yeah. gratification challenge. Like even now we're, you know, as we're recording, I'm sure there's about 15 Slacks that I'm getting from people and they're like, where are you? I'm like, I have other things to do at any given moment. So yep. I feel like it's it's a it's a challenge as an agency and that sense of urgency versus email. So that was an interesting I just you know wanted to comment on that one because I feel like with email there's a little bit of a level of patience with it versus Slack, which is like, why are you talking to me? What are you doing right now? Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, another another project management platform that I've used over the years. Uh, well, we use a lot of Google Drive. You know, so files and folders and accessibility, uh, governance. Uh, well, we invite eliminates the Mac PC conundrum yes. all of us have lived through at various times. So. Yes, uh, we invite our clients into uh, our Google Drive so that mm -hmm. they can see what we're working on and get approvals, and we can collaborate right there. Uh, you know, I think the best asynchronous communication tool I've used previously was Basecamp because you can literally, and we kind of use Google Docs like that now where, you know, I've got a client agenda document and we just, the next meeting, we have the next agenda at top, at the top. And it's literally a huge list of what we've talked about over, you know, the last 18 months by date, by topic, it's searchable. So it's a, and again, they have access to, so they can update it uh, if some if they want to address something. It just helps helps reduce right. email. Well, this is this has been a very um, enlightening chat. We appreciate your your transparency on a lot of these things. You know, the fun part of hosting this podcast is we get to talk to a lot of different shapes and sizes of agencies and and the different ways that you're approaching and how that works and how you scaled. So let me ask you a couple more, couple more kind of final questions. So as a, as an agency owner today, what would you say, you know, outside of the usual suspects, what keeps you up at night? What's that one thing that's kind of going, Meh, you know, uh, capacity. That's what keeps me up at night, having enough capacity. Uh, and, and when I speak of capacity, it's having enough people, skilled enough to do the jobs that we need done for our clients and ourselves. You know, right now I'm teaching an SEO class and I'm using my you know, Lyft digital marketing website as an example, and I'm finding a bunch of holes. <laughs> it's always, it's, you know, the plight, the plight of all of us in that space, the, our stuff is always the last to get any sort of love and attention. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I'm almost always working on adding capacity to our agency, whether that's, you know, people and human resources, whether it's, you know, uh, getting our existing people more training and, and up leveling their skill set. And I'm always working on and not doing a great job of building in ownership and leadership capacity so that I can push work down so that I can work on higher level work. And that's always a, that's probably the biggest bottleneck is me to yeah. uh, agency, agency growth. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. When you are small, that's how you try to think, right? That's what basically stops your growth. Like how, how can I not become a bot bottleneck? How can I, you know, find ways and optimize my processes and hire the right people who can, you know, take, take over what I'm doing so I can think beyond just the day-to-day -day activities. So how, uh, how do you see the future? Like, what do you think is the future growth looks for you? Looks like, you know, for, for you, for your agency, because you have certain limitations where you are right now. Yeah. You're trying to fill that gap. You're trying to overcome that. But in your vision, where do you see this going? Like, where do you think, where do you want to go? And where do you think realistically will happen over the next few years for you? 
Well, I, I, I'm very big believer in, you know, this great resignation uh, is, is because of the availability of being an independent contractor and being a freelancer. I think a lot of people have started figuring out, Hey, I can have, you know, three, four, five part-time jobs and make better money than I was at my full-time job. And I get treated way better. Like you don't have that, you know, a whole boss over you because you've got four or five different places that you're getting income from. Your eggs are literally not all in that one employment basket. Uh, so for remote work and agency work, to me, there's like an, a huge untapped resource uh, as long as you're willing to train people and to develop people. I think that's another big piece too. You know, everybody wants to hire somebody that's already baked. And that's why there are fewer jobs at the top. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a dearth of jobs at the bottom. Uh, I'll post, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, this time last year, I posted a paid internship job. You know, now again, we're, we're paying people to be interns, focused on you know, uh, college, uh, juniors and seniors, in you know marketing advertising english communications roles uh paying them 20 bucks an hour so it's decent money uh it's not nothing but uh in the first day i got 350 applications it was staggering holy smokes yeah and it's because Oh, it, 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 it was literally like my email was just ding, 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 ding. It was crazy. And I think that exists because of the unwillingness to develop people. Me as a business owner, I have limited resources and time. So yeah, I would love to get somebody who's already been doing this for 10 years. That'd be great. Except that person's pretty much me and I'm not going to work for me because I want to work for myself. So, you know, uh, yeah, the, the willingness to develop people, I think there's, there's ultimately a, a never ending potential for talent there. And it's one of the reasons why I've pivoted to really being dedicated to only hiring veterans for the same way, for the same reason. Tons of it. I went into the Marine Corps straight out of high school. Uh, I got into this industry with zero training, but I, my willingness to learn and my curiosity, I taught myself all of this stuff because back then uh, there was no training in place. You know, uh, for those people now, you know, a lot of military skills don't translate to civilian life. So I almost feel like it's a duty to train them up. And yeah, uh, so far so good. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't uh, run into a dud yet. Yeah. Knock on, knock on some wood there. Right. So, yeah. Well, this was a, this was a great chat, you know, thank you. I know I said it before, but thank you for being so transparent about how you've, you've built this and how you've transitioned and um, you know, thank you for what you've done for this country as well. I will say that. Thank so, you. Um, you know, it's uh, where people can find you. I've got a little bit of a laundry list here for folks. So we've got you on LinkedIn and <laughs> Uh, no, it's good. Everybody does. We're all on the internet. That's where we should be. So uh, we've got you on LinkedIn. We've got you on the Twitter, Aaron M. Welsh, uh, your company website, which is lift-digital.net and your personal website, aaronmwelsh.com. So this was, was a great chat. So thank you so much for, for those listening. If you've enjoyed the conversation, if you've learned something or laughed today, please tell somebody about the podcast. Thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Find our other episodes on agencies that build.com. Plus we're listed anywhere you find your favorite podcast.